one of the things I learned was like, there are a lot of ways to do things right, but there's like one way we actually do things. And for me, I never wanted the customer to know if they were in a franchise location or a company owned location, like it should all really feel the same. And but I think it is important that there is somebody who has that really discerning eye that's like, this could be a little bit better. Welcome, everybody, back to Broadcast Your Authority with your host, Tamara Thompson. I'm so excited for this episode today. I have some awesome co-hosts with me. Say hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And I'm really grateful for this guest that came in today. Um, we actually met not too long ago, and I was really grateful for the opportunity to get to know a little bit more about her. And I love the story that I know so far about her, and we're going to get a little bit more into that story. And uh, she's here with us in studio in person. So I'm really grateful for, for Allie Webb. She is a New York best, uh, New York Times bestselling author, Canopy president, co-founder of Dry Bar, uh, Squeeze, and Beckett and & Quill. And after spending 15 years um, as a professional hairstylist, uh, she left the hair industry um, in 2005. And um, she started a family. And, you know, being a stay-at-home mom, after five years, she decided to find a way to continue pursuing her creative side. I know everybody's got a creative side out there, and we have to ex explore those passions. And so she did that. And uh, she actually started an uh, in-home blowout service uh, to her, her, her mommy friends and quickly expanded it into a mobile operation in 2009. And in 2010, when she opened Dry Bar, the first one in Brentwood, California, 10 years later, it had over 150 locations. Like that's, that's insane and in incredible. And uh, she's just got a great story. And she basically turned the Dry Bar brand, creating a line of products and tools that sold at the popular retailers such as Nordstrom's, Sephora. We actually have a story about Sephora last night, but we won't get into that right now. <laughs> and uh, she recently... Uh, um, selling this product uh, division to Helen of Troy for $255 million. And uh, that's an incredible feat to go through, but there's so much more behind the stories. Um, but we're also going to be focusing on her book today called The Messy Truth. And for those of you that will be watching this live, you'll be able to grab a copy uh, when this airs. So I'm super excited and grateful for you to be here today, Allie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it, I, I'm super grateful you're here in person. I know it takes a little hop, skip and a jump on a plane, and uh, but we're, we're grateful to have you here. You. And um, well, tell me a little bit like, well, I guess we could just dive into the messy truth of it. But um, I first want to know, like, when you're building Dry Bar, like, did you ever really think that it would get to where it is today, like going through that process? Like, what was kind of your vision for it? No, I mean, it was it was never meant to turn into what it did. I mean, it was really, you know, like you were saying in my bio, I mean, I, you know, I was a stay at home mom. I was really grateful to be a stay at home mom. I loved being at home with my boys. And after five years of that, I just started to get kind of the itch to do something for myself, which is when I started the mobile blow up business, which brought me to like, you know, my mommy friends and doing their hair. And, you know, what I what I discovered that was that there was really kind of a need for this like affordable price point for women to get blowouts because they were loving they were loving that I was only charging 40 bucks and going to their home. And then I realized like, you know, there's a bigger opportunity here, you know, to turn that my mobile business, me running around to women's homes, you know, into a brick and mortar. And so that's kind of how the idea really was born. And I went to my brother, who's my business partner and also bald and has no had no business being in the hair in the hair industry. <laughs> You know, and I said, I'm having so much success in my mobile business. I feel like maybe we should turn this into a brick and mortar instead of me going to them. They come to me. And and so, you know, it was kind of like a whim of an idea. And we thought, you know, maybe this works. Maybe women, at least the women I knew that I was already servicing would come in and that, you know, would be a thing. We just we never would have imagined it would catch on the way it did. But but, you know, it was like it's one of those things that, you know, we very quickly realized we weren't selling blowouts. We were selling the happiness and confidence that women get from great hair. I mean, you just can't deny that. So, you know, once we realized that and we realized like, 
the transformation you would see in a woman when she walked in the shop and then when she left the shop was unbelievable. It was night and day, you know? And so I think very early on, even though it wasn't planned and my brother was still operating a business, my ex-husband who did all, all the branding and creative for Driver, he was still, you know, a creative director at an advertising agency. I still had to go pick up my kids from school. Like, you know, we, it was going to be like Ali's like project and thing. And, you know, my brother also funded the business and I had sweat equity and I didn't know what sweat equity meant back then, but it was a pretty cool concept. And, you know, so we just had no idea it was going to, it was going to take off the way it did until uh, honestly day one, when we opened to a completely full shop and we were totally oh, in a room. How mess. long did it take to open that, that first shop? And then after that, how many stores, how quickly did those locations appear over the years? I mean, I think it took, I don't know, six to eight months to get the first shop open. And, you know, it was crazy. It was in the middle of a recession or towards the end of a recession in 2010. And, you know, again, we didn't really know what to expect. When we first opened, we were 30, it was a $35 blowout. And, you know, <laughs> that just came, women were coming in, coming in left and right. And it was so much busier than we anticipated it would be. And so, like I said, that, that first day we were like, oh my God, we are on to something, you know, this how did crazy. you start marketing it when with the grand opening? We we did, you know, as we were building the store, you know, the build out of the of the first shop, if you know L.A., it's on it's on San Vicente and Barrington in Brentwood Gardens. And so that thoroughfare of San Vicente, you know, is where, you know, most people, if they're going to Brentwood or the Palisade, it's just, you know, it's a place where a lot of people see. So on the window we had is my brother's idea to put the first 250 people who sign up on our website will get a free blowout which I thought was like bananas. And I was like, we're never going to make any money because like the idea of doing <laughs> 250 blowouts seemed crazy to me at the time. It's so small thinking now, but did you have help in the operations part? Like who was doing the actual like blowouts? Like, well, we, ha we hadn't opened yet. So okay. that was still part of the marketing. And then, you know, we were, and then we had, you know, we had hired PR and because I had worked in PR and my brother had worked in PR. So we understood the PR machine and the fact that like, this concept was so new and different. We knew it would get a lot of attention. I don't think we got, we, I don't think we imagined it would get quite as much as it did. And so there was so much stuff leading up to it. And I don't know if anybody remember, remembers Daily Candy, but Daily Candy was like, you know, uh, it was, you know, gosh, it was so many years ago, it was 15 years oh, ago. Newsletter, right? Yeah. And yeah. it was like, it was like a newsletter that you would get in your inbox. You know, this was like kind of around the era where smartphones were starting to happen. And it, whatever Daily Candy said, you did. You went to, it was, it, they always, you know, delivered something cool and new. And they wrote up uh, this pithy piece about like hot air blowing into LA. And and sure enough, people started booking from that email that went out, which was, you know, part of why we opened to a busy shop. So, you know, there was a little bit of PR, a lot of marketing. And because I had this community of moms in LA that were kind of rooting for me and already knew what I was doing, I had this like built-in community. So it was a lot of different areas that the, like the marketing ultimately came from. And then when we opened the first shop, then it, you know, it was a real domino effect. I was doing, you know, morning TV and I mean, you name it. It was, you know, it just really blew up. No pun intended. <laughs> I was just thinking. That was that. Good. That was I, good one. <laughs> I mean, I've said that a few times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, um, what, during the process, like what do you think was the most like challenging, um, you know, the thing that you learned, like opening, growing, scaling a business, even going into selling it later on, like what, what was probably the most challenging thing and what was the most rewarding aspect to, to doing this journey? I mean, the whole thing was incredibly challenging. I mean, from <laughs> like all of it, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, it was, it was, it was good problem. We had good problems, you know, I mean, to your earlier question about operations, like we did not have enough stylists hired. That first shop in Brentwood is an eight chair shop, one of our smallest now to date. And I didn't hire enough stylists because I didn't know what the demand was going to be. So I, you know, for many, many months, I was hunkered down in that first shit chair in our shop doing blowouts, watching the front desk, watching like the line of stylists and like, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, it was amazing, but we didn't know how busy it was going to be. So again, a good problem to have. And then once, you know, once we really got going and we, you know, we were so busy day after day, and then it was more like people were getting mad at us because in the early days, we also had like pop-ins welcome. Like you don't have to necessarily make an appointment. And then we realized that, that was a mistake. Like people actually do need make to an make an appointment for the most part because it was just so busy, you know? And so 
then the, the biggest problem was like, which would be a problem throughout history, throughout the, the test of time is stylus. Like we just did not ever have enough stylus because we had so much more demand than we had supply and finding great stylists, training them. I mean, there's just so much that went into that. That's still to this day. I mean, even now post COVID, it's also an incredibly, I mean, everyone's having that problem, but finding great quality stylists who really want to be there, who have like the right attitude and mentality. That was, that was really challenging as we grew and scale. It was always the biggest problem that we had. And, you know, and then there was a million other problems. Like, you know, we could never have foreseen that we would have phones in the shop, which seems like such a silly, odd thing, you know, because we had a phone, of course, and you open a business, you have a phone, which is so silly. But what happened was, you know, when we were, the shop was like bumping, loud, fun, energetic, the music, the blow dryers. And then the phone was also ringing and people were trying to book appointments because, you know, you could book online, but this was like in the BlackBerry era. I don't know if anybody watching this even knows what a BlackBerry is, but there was, you know, so it wasn't as like, you know, people didn't use their iPhones the way that they do now. And so like 50% of our clientele was calling on the phone and it was like trying to manage, you know, picking up the phone, booking appointments and trying to manage at the front desk. And for me, customer service is like king and the most important thing. And if you're you know, standing, if someone's standing across from you trying to book or pay or whatever they're trying to do and looking at you and then you're like, I'm sorry, I'm on the phone. Like, no, you know, I just hated that whole experience. So I was like, stop answering the phones, let it go to voicemail. We'll call people back, which of course is also not great. But to me, the person that was in front of us, you know, paying us in person, that, that was That's the priority. priority. And so we realized we needed to pull the phones out of the shops, which we did. And then we we got into like the you know, the, the call center business, which was like, I don't know anything about the call center business. And so that was a whole massive challenge that would last forever because as we grew, you know, uh, eventually to 150 stores, I mean, you can do the math on how many clients that is millions, you know? So, so we had to have multiple people on phones in like, in the beginning, it was like in their homes. And I mean, it was just, it was crazy. It was such a, so hard to manage, but, and then, cause then the people were annoyed because they're like, n when they call, they're not calling the shop, <laughs> you know, yeah. we want, it was just, <laughs> Total chaos. But, but, you know, it's like one of those things that you learn as you go and you have to, you know, you have to build that resilience, acclimate and pivot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions to jump in on? Or? Well, I, I want to talk about the business because I, I don't really understand the hair <laughs> business. <laughs> Ben's like, but, I don't get but it. But I understand business. <laughs> yeah. So so you I, wouldn't be the first guy to say that. Well, you know. <laughs> Maybe I'll get discount services. <laughs> Tell, get tell me about, so 150 locations, is this franchise, was it company owned and how did you, how did you deal with quality control? Because you start expanding into cities yeah. and the biggest question is how do we maintain the dry brow brand right. in order to make sure it thrives in every city you're in? So walk me through how the, yeah. how it works. Well, and, and that also was one of the biggest challenges is the quality control from shop to shop. So when we first started you know, we were totally in our, over our heads and it was so exciting. It felt like we were on this rocket ship and like, what do we do next? And the second shop opened in Studio City about six months, which felt like an eternity, but in retrospect, it was only six months just because the demand was so strong in Brentwood. So we opened the second shop. It was company owned. And, you know, my brother put in the first like tranche of money to get the store open. My brother had worked for Yahoo early on. So he had made some money and, and then, you know, we opened the second store. The stores are pretty expensive to build. So when did you open the second store? Uh, six months later in Studio City. Okay. And, you know, and so, you, you know, we hadn't, we didn't think about whether we would franchise or not. And it was my, actually my brother who was like, I think we should be franchising. And I really didn't want to franchise because of the quality and because I, it was my baby. And I was like, surely no one's going to do this right. <laughs> you know, it was, it was really how I felt. I felt so precious about it. And so we, we did company owned stores in the beginning. And then, you know, which I think was the right decision in retrospect, we did decide to franchise in cities that we weren't getting to quite as fast, like Arizona and, um, our dear friends who live in Dallas, our lawyer, who is a good friend of my brother's and his wife, actually, ironically sitting in Vegas. I think she was at one of these big hotels and worked in hosp hospitality. And so, you know, that was really important to us because even though Dry Bar was technically a hair salon, you know, I wanted it to operate like, you know, a high end hotel where people are treated really well. And so, you know, the, 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 um, what's the hospitality 
part of it was really important to me. So we did end up franchising and and really we vacillated so much, which I don't recommend, you know, between company owned franchise. And we, we ultimately, to answer your question, you know, ended up uh, owning ourselves, the big cities, LA, New York, Chicago, Boston, like those big metropolitan cities, we were company owned. And then the cities that like we wouldn't have gotten to so fast, like Louisville, Kentucky, and like other cities that have amazing businesses, we franchise those. And, you know, it's it's such a mixed bag. And now with our new concept, Squeeze, which is a massage concept that I can talk about later, you know, we're doing that exclusively franchise. And, you know, I could probably make the argument for both, you know, company owned and, and franchise, but at the end of the day, mostly, you know, all of, we were, we were really, um, we were really discerning with the franchisees we brought, like we went, we put them through quite the process to make sure they were the right partner and what we wanted. And so most of them were really amazing. And the beauty of a franchise organization is that if the, the store isn't doing well and they need to like get business going and get, get out in the community, it's like they're, they have a skin and in the game. And so they're going to really work hard and hustle to make that store successful as opposed to a manager running your store who isn't quite as incentivized. Of course, like you can incentivize them with bonuses and equity and all of that, but it's still quite, not quite the same. If you put a million dollars into the store, you're going to work your ass off to make sure it's successful. And so, you know, that is probably the biggest argument for franchising. You know, obviously the flip side of that is, you know, to your point is I, I, I'm, I have walked into several dry bar locations over the years where the franchisees were like doing things that we were like, no, this is not okay. You know, like ideas and things that they had that were very, very well intentioned, but like not on brand, you know? And that was the biggest thing to me is like, one of the things I learned was like, there are a lot of ways to do things right, but there's like one way we actually do things. And for me, I never wanted the customer to know if they were in a franchise location or a company owned location, like it should all really feel the same and you should have the same amazing experience no matter what story you're in. So, you know, as we grew and started to hire more people who were <laughs> smarter than us and had grown and scaled a business, we, you know, we put more measures in place of, you know, quality, quality control. But it, it truly was one of the things that has always kept me up at night about the shops is because inevitably I would walk into shops and I've had a lot of coaching on this, but I would walk in and like lose my shit because things were not the way I wanted them to be. Like the music wasn't loud enough. I didn't like the way that people were being greeted. The, the floorboards were dirty. Like the, the, I mean, you just name it. It was like a sensory overload for me when I would walk in a shop because I'm such a perfectionist and it's my baby and I want it to be a certain way, you know, and, and, you know, there were so many things that they were doing right. And the shop was hopping and it was amazing, you know, but I'd walk in and see all this stuff that I didn't like. And, but I think it is important that there is somebody who has that really discerning eye. That's like, this could be a little bit better. So, so yeah, what that, that answers your question. Uh, I love that, that. that answers it. How, how much is a blowout? Well, <laughs> nowadays, do you, do you even know what a blowout is? I do. I have a, my, my youngest is a daughter and I know it's expensive. Cause it's, no, it's not. Is it a few hundred well, like, bucks? You know, so. It's historically expensive, which is yeah. part of the reason why okay. this concept worked was, you know, what we realized, which I think I always knew in, intuitively because I have naturally curly hair and I've been getting blowouts since I was a kid. I would go to the hair salon with my mom and like beg them to blow out my hair and, and I would not wash my hair for weeks because I was like so <laughs> obsessed with it. Um, but there were two bad choices in the market. There was hair salons who were charging upwards of a hundred and something dollars and they're pressuring you for cotton color and it's just, and you're in a salon. It's just not the experience for just a blowout. But women loved after they got cotton color because like their hair looked better than they could ever do it. And so it was kind of a treat when you went in and got, you know, your hair done. Or, you know, the flip side of that was there was the discount chains, which just weren't a great experience. You're sitting next to a kid getting a haircut. It's like dingy. You just want to get in and out of there as quick as possible. But the price point is relatively low. However, another big thing in the industry that always drove me crazy was the the variable pricing. So, you know, I'd walk into a hair salon with like my friend and who had really long hair. And if I had short hair, they'd be like, well, for you, it's, you know, $85. But for your friend who has shorter hair, it's $45. And you're like, what the fuck? This is, sorry, can I curse? Um, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, this is so like discrimination. Like you're, you're going to charge her this and, and charge me this. Like I just hated that whole idea. And so that was the other thing with, with Drybar, we felt like there was an opportunity 
I get charged a lot because I have really thick hair. Yeah, and it was, yeah. I had really long hair. Exactly, me. and and listen, like of course, like someone with long thick hair is going to take longer to do their hair. But I always felt like it would come out in the wash because then inevitably a woman with a bob would walk in and she would take us like a fraction of the time that your hair would take us. You know, so that was kind of how I thought about it, and I felt really strongly because I had been in that boat too that I wanted to run this business as like no no bait and switch. You know, when we first started, it was $35. I mean, I think now at this point it's up to 55, but this is like Mm -hmm. 12 years later, you know, and so it was this affordable luxury. So you walk in dry bar, it feels really expensive and high end and you're treated really well. And there's, there's flat screen TVs that are playing like chick flicks and you get a glass of champagne or coffee or whatever. And it's a, it's a pretty amazing experience, you know, Yeah, Uh, it's an amazing experience from one who has done it several She's times selling, myself man. yeah well but I'll tell you you know it's a funny story is we opened in Brentwood and obviously we cater mostly to women although in West Hollywood we've had lots of men come in <laughs> um but in Brentwood in particular we we you know a lot of times you know men would come in with their wives and like wait for their wives to get their hair done it only takes like 45 minutes and a lot of times men will get what we would call like a scalp massage like a 10 minute scalp massage that you can add on to your blowout which is you know what it feels like when you get your hair washed when you go to get a haircut it's like very relaxing so women would do this a lot but a lot of times like the men would be like oh let me go get a scalp massage and dustin hoffman used to come in because he lived in brentwood all the time just for, <laughs> just for the head massage you know so sometimes we have men is that what led you to think about going like your new business squeeze or N- not really although you know it was it was a similar you know situation and it really squeeze was my brother's kind of idea and and passion because he got massage. He didn't get blowouts. He's bald. Um, and, you know, and, and he felt the same frustration in the massage industry because, you know, there's the, the, again, there's the discount chains, like you guys, you know, them all like that are incredibly successful, despite the fact that they're not very good. You know, the booking is, the, the booking is not great to book an appointment. You have to call several locations and you, it's kind of hit or miss. The decor is off. The customer service is off. It's just not great, but it's the only game in town. Or you go to a spa and overpay. And so there, again, wasn't something that was like in the middle. And we took the, you know, the founding team of Drybar, our amazing architect, Cam, my ex-husband, who did all the branding. And we basically took all of the things that we wished existed in the massage space that did it. Like there's an app. So you tip on the app, you book on the app, and it's highly personalized. We can put your preferences in and, you know, so you don't forget to tell the therapist the things that you like. And if you want the bed heated or not, oil or lotion or lotion. Yeah. And There's like a little button under the bed. So like once you get in, you press the button and then your therapist gets a light goes out and the therapist knows you're ready. I love that. Yeah. Sometimes you're waiting for, you know, five minutes or whatever. Or you're like like running under the covers naked and you're like, shit, they got to come in, you know, it's all like a very stressful experience. And so we were trying to take out all the things that were stressful. And, you know, also like because you, you pay and tip on the app, like when you're done, you just leave. You don't have to like check in with anybody and, you know, check out and wait and all that because you're in this like blissful state and you want to just walk out. So I think I saw I think I saw them open in Arizona. now. We did. There is one. Yeah. So so again, freeze it. Freeze. Where are they all at at this point? Well, it's completely franchise model. Okay. And we actually Brittany Driscoll is our CEO and she was she ran marketing a dry bar for several years and she was just amazing. And she was kind of ready for her next thing. And Michael and I didn't have the bandwidth to do squeeze because we were still heavy in dry bar. And we're like, Brittany was leaving. And we said, Hey, we have this idea for this massage concept. Do you want to like spearhead this? And she did. And so she's just been amazing. She's our co-founder and, you know, Michael and I funded the project, but she's, she's running it. And we, you know, it's been fun to watch her go from like being a super smart executive to like now being a founder and then watch her go through it. And she's just, she works so hard and she's done such a great job. And so they are, are all franchised and, We've sold 80 something units to date. So, you know, we started, when did it start? Right before COVID. Okay. And it was like gangbusters. Like we were off it, it to the races. And if you look at our Yelp reviews, they're almost, I mean, I think they actually are all five star reviews. I mean, we do, she does an amazing job oh. of vetting. And, and also on the app, you can see, you can read all the reviews that people write about their, their, Seriously. their, yeah, their therapist. And, you know, sometimes like I'll go on because I go into squeeze a lot. And, you know, somebody will say like, you know, I loved th- th- this therapist because of this, this and this. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's not what I actually like in a therapist. So I'm not going to go. To, you know, so you get a lot of information about your therapist. So it's a very like intuitive concept. And um, and yeah, it's it's just it's really taking off. And it's it's fun to, you know, to start this new thing and in massage. And, yeah, I'm really proud of it. 
That's incredible. Well, you're doing a lot of great things. I mean, now you're coming out with your book, The Messy Truth. <laughs> Might as well dive into to a little bit more about that as well. So obviously it, it talks about, it says, how I sold my business for millions, but almost lost myself. And I think a lot of people, um, we can have these podcast interviews and we can ask all the questions about how she scaled her business and things like that. But I think, you know, when people get vulnerable and share a little bit more about their story and people read about it, like people need to understand, you know, we all go through things as well. And right. so I'd love to share, have you share a little bit more about what people can expect uh, from the messy truth when they when they order a copy. And everybody watching this should order this copy. Yes, please pre-order. There's also an audio book, which yes. is a fun experience. I got to, it. to Thank you. She's like, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't I don't actually physically read books. I only really listen to books because I'm like on the go and walking and I love listening. I listen to so many books. But yeah, I mean, the book was really I've been working on it for years, honestly. And so it's it's really like a, you know, a mix between like a business book and a memoir, you know. So it's really like my life story of like how I, you know, came to develop dry bar, you know, my kind of history and, and so many of the lessons that I learned along the way, I didn't go to college. I don't have a fancy degree. Like, you know, I, I'm not your, like, I think there's a chapter in there called, um, you you know, you're, I'm not your typical entrepreneur or something like that. Um, I should know that, but anyways, <laughs> um, just, you know, there's you know a chapter. I know. <laughs> geez. Um, <laughs> you know, once you finish, if you've ever written a book, once you finish it, you're like, I cannot think about this anymore because you will yes. just change things, process, and change things and change things and change things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not your average entrepreneur. I think that's the actual chapter. And, you know, and, and I think that now we're seeing that a lot more, but you know, I, there, there's no like pedigree I had that like was like, yes, you should, you should run your own business. Like, I really had no idea how to do it. Other than what I had seen, you know, as an example with my parents, they had their own business, but they were in the schmata business. I don't know if anybody knows what that term is, but it's kind of like older ladies, like moo clothes in, in South Florida. And, but they were, you know, I watched my mom bend over backwards for customers. I watched my dad, you know, and how they just operated their business. And I think it was just really ingrained in me. So I have like that entrepreneurial blood, but but actually running a business is a, is a whole other thing. And luckily I had my brother who was able to really help, you know, kind of balance out what I didn't know. Cause I really knew the hair industry having worked as a hairstylist for many years in salons. I knew the business, the hair business, but not like the business business side. So anyways, it's, you know, the book is like chock full of all the lessons, you know, I've learned and, and it was really fun, right? I mean, it was fun and not fun and, you know, very cathartic going back and like, you know, telling all the stories of like the things that we learned along the ways, the things that didn't go very well, the things that we messed up and the things that, you know, I wish I had done differently, like all the learnings and like, there's so many learnings and anybody who's had a business, you know, you just like, you just don't learn it until you get it wrong, you know, and and then letting other people get it lo- wrong and like, you know, you know that what you, you have to um, delegate stuff <laughs> and you don't want to delegate it because you want to do it yourself because you don't think anybody can do it as well as you can. I mean, just I think we've all been. There. I mean, yeah, I mean, you just you just learn that over time. And, you know, and, and some some of these lessons were much harder for me to learn than others. And so I I really tried to like you know, extract every story, every lesson that I could from, you know, running and growing and scaling and ultimately selling dry bar, you know, for the last 10, 12 years. And then, you know, kind of interwoven with like the personal side of it, because there is this like, I mean, there's been this kind of, you know, this rise of entrepreneurs who have gotten like, you know, a lot of you know, uh, attention. And, you know, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to be on the cover of Inc. And like, you look at like Whitney Wolf and Candace Nelson and, you know, these women who have amazing brands and like, we they've really been highlighted. And it's amazing to see because when we started Dry Bar in 2010, like that didn't exist. You know, there weren't like female role models who were running companies and they certainly weren't accessible, which has really changed, you know, but I was, you know, I, I didn't, I definitely didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, and I was just trying to to figure out so much of my personal life while I'm running this business. And I had two little kids and I was, you know, married to Cameron, who was the, you know, creative mastermind that was running with my brother. So, you know, the family dynamic, although it was great because we each had our very clear lanes of what we were good at, you know, a lot ensued in that time. And my boys grew up in the, in the dry bar era. And, you know, my son, when we I ended up getting divorced from my, you know, my first husband, and that was, you know, hard on everybody. And that was, you know, and that kind of sent us all into a bit of a spiral. And my son 
which there's a whole chapter about this in the book. My son ended up going in rehab and it was just like our lives really fell apart. And, you know, I think the purpose of the book is like to show that it's just, it's not, it's, first of all, it's not super glamorous. You know, you're running this business, you're working your ass off, you're working yourself into the ground, but for this great cause and you love it so much. But then he's like, you know, so many other things fall by the wayside and fall apart. And, and how do you navigate all of that? And that's, you know, kind of the book really tells how I navigated it all and how I, you know, kind of came to the other side and, and then it all fell apart again, <laughs> which is also in the book. Um, so, you know, it's like the ups and downs and it's, you know, it's, it's a personal story, but it's also a great business book for someone who's, you know, in the throes of, of starting a business, running a business, or even thinking about it. You know? Yeah. I think a lot of people go into the you know, entrepreneurial space and uh, sometimes, you know, you have your, your values, right? Like you said, you walk into some of the franchises, you're like, oh no, that, that, that's not the way it should be. Like, right. how can you, it's about running business, staying true to yourself and what the brand is and just, you know, learning and pivoting, just like you said. And um, I, I know all of these individuals have, you know, good, inspiring, resilient stories as well. Do you have any uh, questions for, for her as well? I'm just going to, you know, it's, first of all, it's been great getting to know you and um, learning your, your story. And um, I, I can so relate to what you were talking about in the second book, because you said the first was more like tutorial or whatever, yeah. and um, how, you know, this was very cathartic for you, which um, I totally get. Yeah. Being an author myself, it was, um, it was, it was very therapeutic. Um, yes. I just want to know what you're most passionate about today. That's a great question. You know, it's, it's, it's an, I'm in an interesting kind of inflection point on my life, really, where I'm, I'm asking myself that too, frankly, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, because you get, you get to a certain level in your life, age wise, career wise, success wise. And, you know, I'm obviously incredibly grateful and fortunate for the success that I, that I've had, you know, that Drybar's had that I've had personally. And we've, you know, started other companies. I wrote this book and I am at this point in my life, you know, I'm 48 years old and I'm like, well, what now? You know, and I, I feel, (laughs) I liken it to like when I was in my twenties, which is, seems weird, but you know, you know how you're in your, in your twenties and like, you're starting your life and you're like, what am I going to do? Like, what do I love? Like what gets me out of bed in the morning? What lights me up? And, and I'm kind of in that phase of trying to figure that out again. And, you know, the, the one thing that continues to, to draw like that I feel called to is, is being of service in some way. And, and, you know, the one thing <laughs> I know really well is like how to grow and scale and run a business, you know, and I feel like I have some authority in that space. And yeah. so, you know, a lot of what I've been doing in the last couple of years is like mentoring other entrepreneurs. I love that. You know, I'm, I'm on this a platform, I don't know if you've heard of called Intro, where you can, you I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. There's some incredible founders and CEOs on it who, you know, run big companies and you can basically go on and buy time to, you know, 15, 30 minutes, an hour to talk to, you know, the, the head of whoever. And that's, oh, I'm going to check that out. You should. It's, it's amazing. I mean, there's, you know, there's every kind of business owner or founder you can imagine from like, there's interior decorators, there's trainers, there's like people like me there. It's, it's a pretty wide range and it's cool what they're doing because, you know, I mean, listen, like I've had a lot of people come to me, which I'm sure you have too. They're like, Hey, can we get coffee? I want to pick your brain. And it's like, Sure. I mean, I'd love to do that, but I also like want, you know, my time is also valuable. And so it's like, what's, what's the balance there? And, and, you know, the caveat to me is like anybody who comes to me, who's like in high school and college, which I do get that a lot. Like Mm -hmm. I'll talk to them for free all day long because like, that's a different story, but you know, someone who's building a business and like, this is part of their investment to grow their business, you know, and like making a connection potentially with me and I can connect them potentially with these people and networking and all that. Mm -hmm. So intro is a great platform. And I'm actually, you know, starting this mastermind, which I had never done before. Tamara and I were talking about it last night and it's, uh, I'm doing it with Jacqueline Johnson, who's the the creator and founder of Create and Cultivate, which I'm sure you've yeah, heard of. Um, and her and I were, she's also sold her company and her and I were looking for a project to do. And we found this amazing woman, Marina Middleton, who's like a branding expert. And so we're starting this mastermind, which is also like, you know, kind of, kind of an elite group of women who are running businesses and just you know, want to take it to the next level and just want to hear the stories and get advice from us. So, you know, that's something that I'm, I feel really passionate about because it's amazing how, you know, I don't know if this is true for you guys, but like, for me, there's just so much information (laughs) stored in my brain that like, I don't even, 
ever think about. And then someone asks me a question or tells me a problem in their business. I'm like, oh yeah, it's, there's this, this, and this. And like, this is so simple. And like to them, it's not simple, but right. to be able to impart that kind of, you know, wisdom and knowledge that I've accumulated over the, the years is is like very satisfying to me and, and very helpful to them. So that's been a real win-win. And, and then I'm also getting involved in like CHLA, you know, which is a, you know, a children's hospital in LA where I live that I'm, you know, trying to, to volunteer there more and just like, in this mode of like, give back, give back, give back. I think you need to learn how to play golf. <laughs> I've I've tried to play golf. I grew, <laughs> up, nice. I grew up with a dad who played yeah. golf. I actually play tennis. So I'm, I'm playing tennis okay, a little bit. Good. Yeah. And I want to like travel a bit. You know, I don't know. I'm at an interesting point where, where I'm like, you, not sure. Where do you want to travel next? I, I don't know that either. I just want to like explore, you know, different places and like kind of like go where the wind takes me kind of thing, you know. I'm yeah. traveling. What's the first thing you did after you sold your company? You went to bed that night and you realized it's... Yeah, what was that feeling like? What was going through your head? I mean, you, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I don't I don't know that I, it was like... I mean, it was, it was amazing and it was a long time coming. And, I'm, you know, anybody who sold a business knows it takes a very long time to like cross the finish line. And I think it was over a year of negotiating, just like raising money. And But, you know, I'll tell you that what, what was... It, interesting about that is like when we sold our company and, you know, 255 million, which is a massive number, but, you, you know, we had, we got a very, very small portion of that because we didn't have that much equity at that point. And we had, my brother and I, and this was really my brother's, you know, thought and idea because he got burned a little bit in the Yahoo era when, you know, he was worth a lot of money on paper, but didn't sell in time and then wasn't worth as much money. And then his friends who were like off, you know, set for life, he wasn't in that boat. So he had a little fear about, you know, anytime we raised money and we raised about 75 million all in all as we were growing dry bar, was that like we need to take money off the table every time we raise money. So we did that, you know, and I would say that was really more where we made our money versus when we sold the whole thing. So it was amazing. And like, oh, my God, I can't believe we did this. And what's what's also funny and ironic is like in the first year or two when we were like, I wonder if we're ever going to sell this thing. And I, in my mind, and my brother reminded me of this, like I was the one who was like, I think we're going to sell it for $250 million, which, wow. you know, was crazy because, yeah, crazy. you know, <laughs> I know it was so nuts. And I was it's like, oh, we, yeah, I mean, wow, was, exactly. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was exhilarating, but it was also like, you know, again, it wasn't like, like, you know, my friend, um, Jamie Kern Lima, she's the founder of it cosmetics and they sold to like, for like a billion dollars to L'Oreal and, you know, and, and like even, um, uh, Spanx, um, Sarah Blakely, you know, like they didn't, they held like all the equity in their company for most of it until they, I, they sold the majority recently. And, you know, and I was like, man, what, what would it be like to have act or like the soul cycle girls is another good example. I think they sold for 180 million. Don't quote me. And I don't think they had any investors. Like they walked away with all of that money. You know, it's like, that wasn't the case for us because we had to raise money based on, you know, how expensive our stores were and all of that. And, so it's it's an interesting, you know, certainly not complaining, but it wasn't that, oh, we made two hundred and fifty five million dollars. I wish. Um, so, you know, it was it was exciting, but it was like, you know, we had finally gotten to the finish line. It was also a little like, oh, shit, what now? You know, and, and then there's like, you know, what comes along with it, which I'm sensitive to how I talk about this. But, you know, when somebody buys your business, somebody buys your business and you're not in your you don't you don't call the shots anymore. And that that was a a spiritual exercise for me of like, oh, I don't have authority here anymore, you know, and I wasn't asked to stay involved. And so that was a little bit of a like, oh, so you didn't stay on for like a year or two. You, that wasn't part of the deal. Nope. So I was a little surprised about that myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, away your child. Yeah. You know, but it was, uh, you know, in fairness, it was like selling the business also came at the heels of my life having really fallen apart, going through a divorce, my son going through rehab. And I was like barely holding on in that phase, you know, so I wasn't like super, you know, I, and at that point we had hired so many people, you know, I wasn't running the company anymore anyway. So I wasn't, I wouldn't even say it was like an integral part, you know, I was still developing product and I was still overseeing a lot of things, but not nearly at the level that I once was. So, you know, I was also not in a position of like, oh, I'm, you know, super important to the day to day. I wasn't, you know, but it, I was just, you know, at this point in my life where everything was really changing, you know, for me personally. So it was an, it was an interesting time. And then like 
the next day the world fell apart and, you know, and then we, we went into lockdown, you know, it was so soon. I mean, I literally, I think within weeks of, of selling it. You're glad you sold it. Oh my God. Oh, Are you so kidding? Nice. That's God I mean, we were all like, <laughs> like oh, like, holy God. shit. Like this oh, was like very, it was so divine. close. And we knew, you know, at that point, cause we sold the business, I think in like February or, or March of 2020. And there was rumblings, right? Like remember when we were learning about COVID and we were like, ah, you know, it'll be a week or two. And like, you know, nobody realized the severity of it. And so <laughs> we were like, oh my goodness, like I can't, thank goodness we sold when we did, you know, because then everything plummeted. Yeah. Well, wow. did, did they realize that your SOPs, your processes that were in place in the company were so strong, they didn't need you there anymore? That's yeah, probably what happened. A hundred percent. You know, they didn't. You know, you I brought in an incredible CEO too. I I met him at an event. John yeah. Hefner. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. mean, John, John was such an intric integral part of us getting to the next level. I mean, when John came in, <laughs> You know, we used to say, Very John, smart, humble man. Yeah, he's incredible. And and he, we used to joke that he was like the adult in the room, you know, because it was like me and my brother. And, you know, excuse me, although we didn't really get into many fights, though it's ironic. It's such a funny story. I don't know. I don't think I put this in the book. I should have. There was Michael and I never really fought. We were always like pretty aligned. And, and you know, Michael could tell me things that most people couldn't. Like people were scared of me, which I was like, what? Which that's a whole other story. But Michael and I were getting, we got into this fight one day because we were actually, ironically, opening a shop in Vegas. Since we're sitting in Las Vegas. And uh, uh, the one that Cosmopolitan. The Cosmo, yeah. Yeah, last night, yeah. And, uh, you know, if you've been in a dry bar, you know that they're they're very white, like the white chairs, the the marble floor. You know, so we were, you know, we were always like, aware, like sensitive to like spillage and whatever. And so when we were opening the, the the Vegas, the first Vegas shop, we had a full bar so you could like buy drinks because it's Vegas, you know, and we of course wouldn't do that at other shops because people are driving and all that. But we got into the, <laughs> my brother and I got into this argument about having red wine or not having red wine. I was like, we don't, we shouldn't have red wine because, you know, red wine stains and we don't want to spill red wine on the floors or the marble. And, and he's like, no, of course we should have red wine. And I was like, why? He's like, because it's a bar and all bars have red wine. I'm like, but it's our company and our business. We can do whatever we want. And he was like, and we just got into such a fight about this. And it was like, one, it was just such a funny, in retrospect, and we got really mad at each other. And we were like yelling. And I think it was obviously more of like a power play. And but John, and that day we had big investors coming in who were going to make a sizable, you know, um, investment in Drybar. And Michael and I are screaming in our, we shared, we shared an office. It was a big office, but we shared it just so we could like know what was going on in each other's world. And it was, that was really fun. But jo John like walked in and he's like, you guys, like, what are you doing? Like the investors are there. And like, you know, like, it's like dad came in and like <laughs> reprimanded us. It's such a funny story. But yeah, jo John was really, you know, when we interviewed John, which by the way, I also really did not want, my brother was the CEO and I didn't want to replace my brother. You know, like Drybar was doing amazing. I was like, what do you mean? He's doing such a great job. But even my brother was like, I think this is going to get too big for me. Like I've never been the CEO of a company like this size and we're growing and scaling. I think we need somebody who actually has been in those shoes and knows how to do that. And and it, our private equity guys at the time, Castanea, which is now Stride, they were like, we, we really think you need a professional CEO. And in my mind, a professional CEO was some like very stodgy ivory tower executive that was going to have no idea and not get me and not get the concept. So I was like, no, and very bratty about that whole decision. And, you know, they're like, let us vet. That's what he, that's what he, said, he said at the event. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, she was so picky, but she selected me. <laughs> and so that's funny. Yeah. I mean, he knew because I was very like anti replacing my brother. And I just thought it was like, and again, I was wrong. In retrospect, it was one of the best decisions we ever made. And, you know, I was wrong, but I was kind of throwing a fit about it. And they said, let us vet people. And we'll only bring you, you know, people that we really think would be a good fit. And there was a couple of people that we met that I was like, no, this doesn't feel right. And it did feel like the ivory tower and like, you're not going to, you're not going to get this. But, you know, John came in and, you know, if you've met John and I would say this, if he was standing here, he's like very tall. He's like the vision of corporate. Yeah, and, and, and I was like, I remember like seeing him and like shame on me for like judging him. I was like, that's definitely not the guy, you know, <laughs> like we have, you know, we run this like really like cool and hip business and it's like women and hair. And I was like, this is like this corporate dude in a suit. No, you know, and I was so wrong because when we sat down with him, he, we just fell in love with him. Like he really understood and he had worked in so many founder led organizations that he understood the dynamic of like, 
working for a brother sister team or a husband and wife team. Like he really understood that. I, I remember he used an analogy like, you know, we're a three legged stool and it doesn't work if like we're not all, you know, something more <laughs> eloquent than I'm putting it. But, you know, he really understood the importance of like not coming in and trying to change everything and trying to like step on our toes, rather working really, you know, in lockstep with Michael and I to to get this business to the next level. And, you know, and he's a great manager. He's not a micromanager. He he helped like hire the right people to get the right people in place, you know, for the business to to really flourish. And and it was a great it was a great decision. It was a great hire. So who won the argument? <laughs> well, was there red wine or was there not red wine? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. So I did not win the argument and there was red wine that went into the shop, but you know what? It never sold and we ended up taking it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so touche. I love this. This is this is incredible. These are incredible stories and I'm excited to listen to the audio version of the book. I'm just like you. <laughs> like I listen to audio books. Well, you everywhere. hear the like emotion. Yeah. yeah. And, and I and I enjoyed recording it. It's, okay. It was fun. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad that you recorded it because sometimes people yeah. have like voiceover yeah, artists. Me. But um, yeah. some British person. Well, this is uh, this has been an incredible interview. I really appreciate you and uh and uh, I'm really excited for this book. And for those of you that are out there, The Messy Truth um, by Ellie Webb, definitely pick up a copy. She's got incredible stories probably in and out of the book. Yes. So be sure to <laughs> follow her on social media. And thank you so much for joining us today. I truly appreciate your time. and for having me. It was fun. Yeah. And I love the roller coaster ride last night. <laughs> <laughs> we rode the New York. Is it the, is the it New York? New, New York. New York. The New, oh York New York. That's no joke, that roller coaster. It's not. Yeah, it was a spontaneous decision. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had fun and, and I had fun today. So thank you so much. And for those of you that are watching at home, be sure to subscribe, ring that bell, and uh, be sure to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. I appreciate you. And we'll see you in the next episode. Yeah.